The attraction to substance abuse isn't the chemical hooks. It's the way at which it, it's perceived to solve an unbelievably complicated problem for somebody. It pacifies the passage of time with some unbelievable purchase relief that they have never experienced before. And it did it with such unbelievable ease. I mean, all I had to do was this. Yeah. Have a pill. Yeah. And it's gone. That's the human so condition, hooked. isn't it? Like seek pleasure, avoid pain, expend the least energy possible. We're set up exactly. to fail, aren't we? Basically. That that you know, that's that's exactly it. Today, I'm honored to be interviewing vegan powerhouse Adam Sood, aka plant-based addict. Not only is he a suicide survivor who's been recovered from addiction for eight years, but he's headed up a new study looking at the benefits of a whole foods plant-based diet on early addiction recovery. The findings from this first of its kind trial have been nothing short of earth shattering and it will no doubt help bring an end to suffering for thousands. He's a wonderful guy with a fascinating story and a critical message. This is my interview with Adam Sood. Uh, Adam, thank you for taking the time to be with us today and share your inspiring story. I know my audience are going to learn a lot from your experiences and your wisdom. Appreciate it. I'm so happy to be here. You're very well. Thank you. Um, now, Adam, you grew up, grew up in Texas. I imagine yeah. um, that there weren't too many vegans uh, living there back then, and your diet must have looked quite different. Um, you know, obviously, to, you're eating whole foods plant-based now, aren't you? That's true, yeah. Yeah, so what was yeah, it like uh, growing up? How were you eating and things? Yeah, you know, I grew up a seventh generation Texan. So, like, I mean, like, wow. you know, uh, I was eating burgers and barbecue. That was the that was the basis of everything was, you know, meat, eggs, dairy, every single meal. Uh, you know, it was a cultural thing. It was, uh, it was like a familial thing. Like it was, you know, you, it, I mean, this, I think this, this is an uncommon, you know, you eat the, the, meat, the, the, the diet of your family, of your parents, your, your parents are eating what their parents made. And it just sort of like, just stair steps its way down into your life. And, you know, I, I, I had a great childhood, you know, I, I played all kinds of sports. My dad was a, was a competitive uh, in high school, he was the captain of his basketball team. And then he was a marathon runner in college. And, uh, and so, you know, he got me into sports. I played sports and I had friends that we rode our bikes to and from school, you know, but like growing up for whatever reason, I got criticized quite, quite a lot for, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm, I was born in 1982. So I grew up in like the greatest era of junk food that ever existed. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, the, the unregulated junk food, junk food era. And I got criticized because my dad had, um, his dad had passed away when he was, when, when my dad was 25, his father passed away from colon cancer. Uh, his mom had survived a heart attack and survived cancer. Uh, my, you know, my dad was very sort of critical of my weight and my Uh, eating, you know, and I honestly believe that it was because he was very hyper vigilant of people that he loved and what were the cues that could indicate a potential risk Mm -hmm. of him losing someone that he cares so deeply about. And I think for most people, criticism is easier accessed and empathy and compassion, right? It's easier to try to correct somebody than it is to, to sit down and open up and invite them in. And, yeah. you know, I was 10 years old and I started to believe over the course of time that, that there was just something wrong with me, that there were conditions upon which I was and was not allowed to accept myself physically, uh, when, which I wasn't, was and was not allowed to love myself completely. And there were conditions upon which I could and could not be accepted by other people. Yeah. And that, you know, became a very, very painful uh, truth that I just fully owned. Now, I, I don't blame myself. I was 10 years old. You know, one of the things I think is really important is that, you know, when we look at our past story, that we do so with compassion and the understanding that I think that at every point of our lives, we're doing the best we can with what we know. Yes. And, um, I sort of fell into this disruptive and destructive, um, uh, relationship with food. I was a closet eater because I just couldn't, I couldn't not, this is how I like to say it. I couldn't, I couldn't not do the thing Mm -hmm. that my dad so desperately wanted me to do, which was not eat 
junk food, not, you know, all my friends were doing it. And I, you know, mm-hmm. it's cliche. Sure. But you know, Hey, I wanted to be, I so desperately wanted acceptance. Yes. And, um, and about the same time I was diagnosed with ADHD, I was put on Ritalin and it just sort, sort of was this other confirmation that there were things about me that were broken. Mm-hmm. There were things about me that didn't work. And by the time I entered high school, we had moved from Houston, Texas to Austin, Texas. And I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any friends. And the doctors had changed my prescription from Ritalin to Adderall. And Adderall is just another stimulant-based form of medication used to treat ADHD. But it is essentially medically pure amphetamine. Mm-hmm. That's what the stuff is. Wow. And it's a party drug. You know, it, it's a, it is a you know, medicinal uh, it's a pharmaceutical that's used to treat behavior disorders, but it's also a party drug. And once kids in school found out that I had it, I became invited, started getting invited to parties. I started to feel acceptable yeah. to people. I started to see that I had value to offer other people and that people wanted that value. They wanted me around and I got hooked to it. I got, I got hooked to Adderall cause it seemed to magically fix every single thing that I believe was broken about me, right? It yeah. was, I was a little bit overweight in high school. Adderall is amphetamine. So if I take extra Adderall, I lose weight really easily. Mm-hmm. I, I, I had, I was able to get invited to parties. I was, had unbelievable confidence when I was on it. I could make friends. I could get girlfriends. I could have the study habits that my dad wanted me to have. Mm-hmm. It was like every single thing that I believe was a problem in me and in my life was magically fixed with the most unbelievable ease that I had ever experienced in my life. It was almost as if the universe universe said, you know what you've had enough. Here you go. Here (laughs) all is solved. And that's really, that's the, that's like, that's what I really think is so important for people to understand is with the attraction to substance abuse, isn't the chemical hooks. It's the way at which it it's perceived to solve an unbelievably complicated problem for somebody. It pacifies the passage of time with some unbelievable purchase relief that they have never experienced before. And it did it with such unbelievable ease. I mean, all I had to do was this. Yeah. Have a pill. Yeah. And it was gone. That's the human so condition, hooked. isn't it? Like seek pleasure, avoid pain, expend the least energy possible. We're set up exactly. to fail, aren't we? Basically. That that you know, that's that's exactly it. That is exactly it. Because not only does it give you pleasure, it gives you reward pleasure, which is really important for people to understand. Reward pleasure, dopamine is not just a pleasure chemical. It's a reward pleasure chemical. It's your body telling you that you have just achieved something by some sort of effort that has statistically increased your likelihood of biological success. So not only does it feel good, but it feels right. Mm -hmm. And that's really important for people to understand why when someone is so in the throes of substance abuse, they go, you know, they can ask them, you know, can't you see what you're doing to your life? Can't you see what's going on with you? Don't you see how far you've fallen? And they go, yeah, I can, but it just feels so right. And you don't know the pain I was in and you can't understand how easily this not only removes that pain from my life, but that it feels like I'm doing the right thing every single time that I do it. Yeah. And my life, my life went that way. That was the trajectory of my life. By the time I was in college, uh, I was fully addicted, um, was using about 450 milligrams a day and the average prescription is about 20 milligrams per day. Oof. And um, wow. I would stay up for about six days straight. I wouldn't sleep. Uh, and well, then on that the must weeks be driving you crazy, you must be hallucinating in all sorts, no? Oh my gosh! By day four, or day five, I'd have you know, I'd be hearing things that weren't happening. I'd be seeing things. I'd, I'd you know, slip in and out of like sleep because the drug would wear off, and I wouldn't have slept for five days. And I'd like sort of pass out for a second, then wake up, and then pop pills. Wow! And um, you know, I dropped out of college. I came back to Austin. I uh, started to really I became a criminal drug addict where I was buying and selling drugs on the street. I was scamming people. I was stealing from people. I was treating my family like garbage and my life just spiraled out of control. The days when I was using, I was, I was just fully using. I mean, I was so into it. I couldn't be present in my life because my life had become too painful a place to be. Yeah. And in the days when I didn't have substances, I was eating 5,000 calories of fast food a day. And I reached a weight about 350 pounds. And 
it was, it, you know, the thing is, it, it's, it's this very sort of, I didn't, I, it wasn't a plan, you know, yeah. like <laughs> it's amazing how this sort of slight and imperceptible shift occurs where all of a sudden I woke up and I was so far into it that not only did I not know how it happened, I couldn't see through the fog of it to understand how do I even get out of it? I didn't know that it was okay to, to, to be struggling with something like that. I didn't know that it was okay not to know how to get out of it. And I didn't know that it was okay to tell my family that I was dealing with it and I don't know how to get out of it. And so on August 21st of 2012, you know, life had just become too painful a place to be physically, spiritually, emotionally, all of it. Um, and again, I didn't have a plan for this either. It wasn't something I was consciously considering. Um, but you know what? Every single day for probably the last two months was a constant experience of knowing that everything that was painful in my life was the worst it had ever been. And there was an absolute certainty that tomorrow would be worse. And when you live in that state long enough, eventually today is impossible. And, you know, I, uh, I can remember I was, it was like two in the morning and I just looked on my table in front of me and my coffee table and there was a, a pile of pills and I just said, you know, I can't do this anymore. Um, I had been constantly trying to hate myself and my life enough in the hopes that one day I'd want to do something about it. And the problem with that way of doing things is that every time I tried to hate myself enough, I tried to hate my life enough. It just made me feel more disconnected from ever being able to reconnect to what's meaningful about being alive. And so I attempted suicide by overdose. Um, and um, I woke up on the floor of my apartment in a puddle of vomit in a pile of fast food garbage surrounded by empty pill bottles with no one around, not because they didn't want to be there for me, but because I had done everything I could to stop them. And, um, I had this unbelievable experience of relief and that was really an unusual thing for me. I, I was kind of confused by it. Uh, and what it got me to do was to consider the reality that had just taken place. See, the only reason that relief was, I was experiencing relief was because there had to have been something about myself and my life that I loved just enough that even though I knew today would be painful, I still wanted to be a part of it for one more day. And that the suicide I had just tried to do was not me trying to end my life. It was me trying to end my pain. Yes. And, you know, I was that person. I was that person that when someone came up to him and said, you know, why do you eat like that? I'd say, you know, fuck you. You know, you don't, you know, this is how I choose to live my life. And if you don't like it, deal with it. And if it costs me five years, if it costs me 10 years, fine, whatever. Five years, you know, people like, you know, I, I, I'm sure you've heard it, but like we throw that number out there, like it's nothing, you know, like, what would my, I mean, my parents would probably have given everything they own away. If I had been successful for just five more minutes with me, I mean, the, it's, it's just the things we choose to believe have consequences mm -hmm. on ourselves and the people that we care about. Right. And I told myself uh, that, uh, you know, I wasn't, um, I wasn't going to let this amazing opportunity at life pass me by. And so I picked up the phone. I called my parents. I asked for help. And I checked into rehab where I was diagnosed with type two diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, erectile dysfunction, bipolar disorder, suicidal depression, anxiety disorder, sleep disorder, attention deficit disorder, and obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Wow. And now for the, for the people who are listening, uh, the majority of those psychological conditions were drug induced and are not clinical. Um, the bipolar disorder was drug induced. The obsessive compulsive personality disorder was drug induced. So it's not the same thing as true bipolar one or two, um, just for clarification. But, you know, I was a walking cliche. <laughs> like I walked into rehab and I'm going to do my 28 days. I'm going to go back and I'm going to go, I'm going to go right back to using, but at least I'll have a handle on it this time. <laughs> like I was that, I was that person. Yep. And thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, 
I was that sick. I'm so glad that I had the diabetes and the heart disease and the erectile dysfunction and all the things that were going on because what it did was it told me you got to do so much more than stop using. If you want five more years of your life, you've got to be willing to change everything about the way that you move through the world or else the diseases are going to get you before the drugs do. And, you know, luckily about a year before that date, I had the opportunity to attend an event hosted by a man named Rip Esselstyn, Mm -hmm. who is the executive producer of the film called the game changers. He's also uh, the the author of the engine Two diet. um, And his dad is Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn from forks over knives and the Cleveland clinic. And I heard this, him and these other thought leaders talk about plant-based nutrition. Now, look, when I went, I went to that event because my dad asked me to go. I didn't know who Rip was. I didn't give a shit about what he had to say. I sure didn't want to learn about plant-based nutrition. But man, did it come flooding back in that doctor's office. Mm. Because the doctor was there telling me that I, you know, that all these diseases were because my genetics. Mm -hmm. You know, I I am diabetic. I am a a person with heart disease. I am all these things and there's nothing I can do about it. I'm going to be on medication for the rest of my life and they're more likely going to get worse. And then these people, these amazing doctors, Dr. Michael Clapper, Doug Lyle, Jeff Novick, uh, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, Rip Esselstyn, these people at this event, what they were saying was, no, 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 listen, the reason why you have these conditions is because your body is doing exactly what's predicted of it, given the way you've been living your life. You're not sick. Your body is very, very healthy. And it is fighting off disease as a result of the environment that you put yourself in. And I said, okay, fine. You know what? I don't know anything about addiction or, you know, mental illness or anything at that point. But what I can do is I can make A plus B equals C with nutrition. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to let this plant-based nutrition be the backbone of my recovery. And so I, that's what I did. I said, okay, fine, let's do this. And uh, I wasn't allowed to change my diet and rehab. Unfortunately, the the dietitians there were not about to let a diabetic with an A1C of 12 eat carbohydrate, unfortunately. Sure. Yeah. But when I moved into sober living, I walked up to my house manager. This is one of my favorite parts of my story. The sober living where I went, you got to choose what you wanted to eat. You wrote out a list and you give it to the house manager. And then he asked the, the, you know, the staff to go get the food and then you have the food at the house. So I walked up to the house manager whose last name, is literally hamburger and asked him to buy me oats and beans and other grains and greens and all this stuff. So my plant-based journey for me started with a hamburger. And uh, That's pretty unique, Adam. <laughs> it's pretty great, right? It's pretty great. Pretty great. And um, <laughs> I just, I, you know what I did? I told myself, I'm going to be willing to be comfortable being uncomfortable mm-hmm. and just do this thing. And it wasn't going to be about trying to get rid of the things that I hated about myself. Cause I tried that for years, you know, yeah, I was diabetic. I had heart disease. I had erectile dysfunction and I was 350 pounds and I didn't want any of those things. Why not? What was it about myself and my life that I loved enough that I wanted to make this change? So I think negative consequences are great for one thing. People don't change their life because of negative consequences. What negative consequences do is they highlight a meaningful bond in your life that's being threatened. Mm. And it's that meaningful bond in your life that people do amazing things for. We either do something we've never done before, or we learn to do something that we already do even better so that we can show up and be more fully present for the bonds in our life that make our lives meaningful. And so I told myself this every single day, this is going to be, you know, it's interesting because I, I can think about my story as, my, as a kid growing up and I was always in an adversarial relationship with my body. I was always trying to outcompete this enemy that I saw as my body. And in, re- in recovery and sober living, there was a shift that happened where I stopped seeing my body as an enemy. And I thought about surviving suicide. I said, man, if there's ever proof that my body's been on my side, it's that day. Because my body has been fighting for me since the day I was born. And on the worst thing I've ever done to my body, literally try to end my own life. My body said, hell no, we're not done yet. You're not done yet. And we're saving your life today. What if my body and I have always been allies? What if it's a partnership? And what if instead of trying to outcompete my weight, 
outcompete my disease. I engage in behaviors that are acts of loving partnership and service to a body that has never given up on me. And that's what I made the plant-based nutrition about. And so within four months, the diabetes, the heart disease, the erectile dysfunction was completely gone. Within 10 months, I had lost over a hundred pounds. Within a year, I was off of all of my medications, all my psych meds, everything. Wow. And uh, I've lost about 180 pounds as of today. And nice. I'm nice. over eight years sober. And it's just been the most incredible journey. <laughs> Thanks, man. Well done, brother. I'm so, that's amazing. That's so inspirational. Thank you. Very good. <laughs> it's an honor to, it. uh, to have this opportunity to connect and uh, chat with you and, and bring your story to people because, you know, this stuff can heal the world, can't it? You know? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, I agree. We're open and vulnerable and authentic. Like that's what the world needs. So. And you know, the thing is, I think human, human beings are, human beings are storied creatures, right? We exist and we live through the stories of ourselves and through the stories of others. Um, from the beginning of time, human beings have told stories as a way to live through each other's experiences. And you know, this better than anybody, you can present data all you want to somebody and it won't ma make a difference, <laughs> but you share a story with them and it's undeniable, right? You, as you are, show up at a gym with all your muscle mass and someone says, no, you can't build muscle on a plant-based diet. And then they look at you and now they can no longer make that statement. Yes. They can't deny it regardless of whatever data they've heard. It's now irrelevant because there's a human in front of them with a story that says bullshit. I <laughs> that's the plan. <laughs> that's the plan. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, that's the whole point. And so, yes, I think that this is really the way, that, you know, we make changes is through stories, through, you know, being of service to people through yes. our own actions and how we show up as our most authentic selves. I love that. How, what do you say, is it that the plant-based diet aids, because I, I want to get onto your amazing study in a minute. How is it sure. that you think the plant-based diet aids in early addiction recovery? Is it the fact that you're doing a service to your body, as you said, or is there mm. more to it than that? So, you know, it's interesting because, after about a year of being sober, I went back uh, because I was in sober living with about 12 other guys who were ages between 20 and 50, all trying to get sober and honestly attempting to reconnect to the meaningful bonds in life. And I, and, and I think that if you look at the experience that I had and the experience that they had in recovery, there's a really in, in interesting observation that can be made. I came in the sickest I'd ever been in my life. And we all had the same program, essentially, in terms of therapy, recovery meetings. You know, we all lived in the same house. Um, but I was the only one who really adopted a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the 10 months that I was there, I was the healthiest I'd ever been in my life. Wow. Yes, I was sober, and so were they. But I was the healthiest I'd ever been in my life. Most of the other guys I was with had either gained weight, gone on more medications or on higher dosages of the medications that they were currently taking. And I thought, this is interesting. What does the research say about nutrition and addiction recovery? It doesn't say anything. Mm -hmm. There's never been a single study ever done on the effects of nutrition and early addiction recovery in a controlled setting. And I thought, that's really interesting. What a disservice. But when we talk about addiction recovery, I think it's important to really look at what we're talking about in an honest and authentic way, because the current narrative suggests that what addiction recovery is, is about dependency. Mm -hmm. An individual checks into treatment for, let's say that their issue is heroin. What they're going to say is, oh, your problem is heroin. And the reason you can't stop taking heroin is because you're an addict. You're born an addict. And once you tried heroin, the chemical hooks for you were so strong, you could never stop using it. So heroin's your problem. Let's get you to abstain from heroin for the rest of your life in some way, shape or form. You got to, you're going to, we're going to, we can give you suggestions. You got to figure that out. Uh, and we'll, that's how we'll call, that's what we'll call success. Complete and total abstinence from heroin is recovery. That's the current model. Mm -hmm. Real world, real world observations do not align with that model it's complete nonsense isn't it complete it's complete nonsense so yeah. what we're talking about when we talk about in my opinion and from what we see in the real world and from amazing journalists who have uh uh observed things there's a great author named johan hari who wrote a book called lost connections it's phenomenal it's about anxiety and depression he also wrote a book called chasing the scream which is about the war on drugs but what we're actually seeing 
is we're seeing that substance abuse at its core, and I mentioned it earlier, is about not wanting to be present in your life because your life has become too painful a place to be. How does that happen? I think human beings have this unbelievable need to bond, right? When we have meaningful bonds in our lives that give us the experience of being alive in a valuable and meaningful way, we have a physical, a loving and meaningful bond with ourselves, both physically and emotionally, that we want to show up and be present for every single day. A meaningful bond with people in our lives that we want to share value with and who we want them to share value with us within a community of shared respect that we want to show up and be present for every single day. We have a meaningful bond with purpose, acts of service that, that is beyond ourselves that we want to show up and be present for every single day. And we have a meaningful bond with the natural world and a future that makes sense to us and is achievable that we want to show up and work for every single day. Now, when those bonds are fully connected, we want to show up and be present in our lives because our lives have unbelievable meaning and value and are very interconnected in various ways that give us a sense of an unbelievable experience of living. But when those, those bonds are severed by whatever reason, trauma, whatever, you, whatever it is, the pain of that disconnection is really, really unbearable. Certainly depending on how disconnected you are from a certain number of bonds. So let's take myself, for example, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, even I was the worst it had been. I had no meaningful bond with myself physically or emotionally that I wanted to show up and be present for. I didn't want to feel myself physically. I didn't want to, I didn't have an understanding of emotions and what they meant and how valuable they are. I thought some emotions were good and some emotions were bad. Some were failure and some were success. Mm -hmm. And I hated myself for it. I didn't feel like I had the right to a meaningful bond with other people that I could show up and be present for. I wasn't working. I had no purpose to show up and be present for. I had no connection with the natural world. In fact, I hid from it. I never left my apartment. And I had no future. In fact, my future was less, it was worse than uh, 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 the absence of meaning. It was terrifying. My future made no sense to me whatsoever. Now, someone comes along to me when I'm in that state and says, hey, would you like some Adderall or some opiates? And I do it. I pop some opiates or I pop some Adderall. All of a sudden, all of the, 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 the experience of being present in that disconnection is gone. It's relieved in a way that I has not been relieved ever before. And when given the opportunity to continue using the statistical likelihood in that situation is very high. Why? Because for the first time ever, I'm given relief from a life that is unbelievably painful. Now let's look at my life now, right? I have a meaningful connection with myself physically and emotionally that I want to show up and be present for a connection with people that I want to share value with, a connection with purpose beyond myself, a connection with the natural world and a future that makes sense. Now, if someone wants to come along and say, Hey, Adam, just so you know, in your drink, I gave you, I, I, crum, I crushed up some opiates and put it in there. You didn't know that. I would have the same euphoric experience that I had before. I would have the same pleasurable response to the opiates that I had before. After the response and the experience was over, the person came back to me and said, Hey man, I bet you liked that. Didn't you? I'd probably say, yeah, it was amazing. And then he'd say, if you want, I'll get you all the opiates you want. You want to keep using. My statistical likelihood of saying yes is incredibly low. Why? Because it has removed me from being present to the things in my life that now give my life incredible meaning and I'm fully connected to. So when we talk about substance abuse, we have to understand that what we're talking about isn't just the substance itself. It's how meaningfully connected are these individuals to the things in their lives that give their lives meaning. And so what I found about nutrition was that it was an unbelievable vehicle to reconnect me to those meaningful bonds in life. Right. It was the best example I'd ever seen. I, I, you know what? I don't know anything else in the world better than a plant-based diet at showing people just how unbroken they are. You know, yeah. it was an absolute daily demonstration of how amazingly connected I can be with a body that was wanting to show up for me, not wanting me to be sick, wanting me to be healthy. I love and it. as I started to feel healthier, I was able to be of better service to other people. I was being able to be a better service, you know, with, with my purpose in my life. I was able to go for walks, uh, you know, uh, on the beach, connect me to the natural world. And then all of a sudden my future started to make more and more sense to me. It looked like something I wanted to be a part of. So I think nutrition does play a very large role. 
yeah. in the recovery process. No wonder you wanted to know the science of it <laughs> and you've taken it upon yourself to start this uh, fascinating study. Can you tell us all, all about that? Yeah. So as I mentioned, you know, about a year out of recovery, I looked to see what the research had to say. And I was shocked to find that there is no research. And um, I found that really odd because anybody who's been in a rehab hospital will understand that not only are you fed three times a day, you're fed at the exact same time as everyone else. And you're fed the same thing as everybody else. It's a completely controlled variable. And what we do know is that people who check into treatment right now, uh, we have a lot of data that says if you do X, Y, and Z, you know, psych, uh, uh, emotional and psychological modalities, right? Therapy, psychotherapy, all these other things. Here's the statistical likelihood of what you'll see. We've measured it. If you do fitness, here's what we know. If you do restorative acts like yoga, here's what we know. Oh, food? No, we have no idea. Eat whatever you want, you know? And I thought, what an unbelievable disservice not to investigate the impact that food has on those early stages of recovery, so I partnered with some unbelievable people. There's a treatment center in Austin called Infinite Recovery. Um, and then I partnered with Nor Northern Arizona University with their health science research department. And then I, uh, I got an unbelievable person named Tara Kemp to be the lead investigator. And then doctors Dean and Aisha Sherzai oh. are the uh, MDs on the study who you, you clearly know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know who doctors Dean and Aisha Sherzai are, they are the world's leading neuroscientists on the effects of cognitive longevity. They are the directors of the Alzheimer's Prevention Program at Loma Linda University, and they are the authors of The Alzheimer's Solution. And then they have an upcoming book called The 30-Day Alzheimer's Solution, which is their cookbook. It's, it's, a, it's unbelievable. Can, can um, I just say, I've chatted to them on uh, Instagram. They're such lovely, bloody people. Oh, they're the nicest people ever. Turns out they're most to me. They're so lovely. They are the, they are the nicest people ever. <laughs> um, and what we decided to do was we wanted to do a controlled trial. So at Infinite Recovery, and we just actually finished the participant part. So it started 12 months ago. Um, is that individuals who check into treatment 24 hours out of after exiting detox. So we don't, we're not trying to get people in detox. You know, most people barely eat when they're in detox, let alone want to hear someone talking about what you're going to eat. <laughs> so after 24 hours of exiting detox, people have the opportunity to join the study. No one is forced into it. And then when, if they agree to be a part of the study, they then have another opportunity. They can choose which dietary group they want to be a part of. Now, academia is going to uh, scrutinize me because it's not a randomized controlled trial, but here's what I know to be true. Individuals in treatment have better outcomes when they have the power of choice. And the whole purpose for me doing this is to help people struggling. So let academia scrutinize me all, my, all they want, that it's a controlled trial, not a randomized controlled trial. That's fine. I am, of course, doing it for the academia because I want to create change in the world, but I'm doing it more for the people who are struggling. Yeah. So they choose either the control diet, which is the diet that's being served at the treatment center, or they can choose the control diet, which is a whole food plant-based diet. And then we give them nutrition education that matches their diet that they chose. Because what we also know is that people who have an understanding of what nutrition does for the body, the self-efficacy that's gained from it, they have greater outcomes. Mm -hmm. And then we do a full spectrum like uh, analysis of everything, full lipid panel, uh, so, you know, your cholesterol, triglycerides, A1C, blood, bio, so A1C, for those who don't know, it's a diabetes biomarker. Then things like high sensitivity C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker. Omega-3 levels, which omega-3 levels have a very strong correlation with brain health. Mm -hmm. uh, various vitamin levels. We're also doing a microbiome study. Nice. So, for individuals, so yeah. fascinating, isn't it, the microbiome? It's unbelievable. So like here for individuals who don't understand, I want to explain, there's a great way to explain how impactful the microbiome is on everything. All right. So Paul, if I was to take you right now and count up the number of cells that make up your human Paul cells that are sitting in front of me, they number roughly 10 trillion. There's 10 trillion Paul cells right now. Now, if I was to take the four to six pounds of bacteria that is in your gut right now, and count up the number of cells that make up that gut bacteria, which is your microbiome, it numbers roughly 300 trillion cells. So of all of the cells that sit in front of me right now that are responsible for this amazing person in front of me, you're less than 10% human. How amazing is that? It's mad. That's amazing. And of course, like 
So it's many times the amount of genes belong to them that are responsible for our metabolism, for, for the metabolic processes that keep us alive. So how so key much. is what we feed those bacteria? We want those Prevotella strains, don't we? Those, those fiber eaters. It's amazing because what we know is that people to throw out this statistic that 90% of your serotonin and 50% of your dopamine is found in your gut. And yes, that's true that they, that, that, that of the neurotransmitters, serotonin and dopamine that are found in the body, 90% of serotonin and 50% of dopamine are in the gut. Mm -hmm. But those neurotransmitters do not cross the blood brain barrier. But what is happening is that there are specific fiber eating bacteria right, that exists within the gut that produce short chain fatty acids and other various nutrients that do cross the blood brain barrier mm -hmm. that are responsible for the formation of those neurotransmitters in the brain. Right, right, right. So the health of your gut is directly linked to healthy neurotransmitter formation in the brain. And so we're going to take the microbiome data and the blood biomarker data, and then we're going to compare it to validated scales of measuring mental, psychological, and emotional health outcomes, everything from self-compassion and resiliency to anxiety, depression, obsessive compulsive drug use, mania, the whole gamut. Wow. And what we're going to get an understanding of is, okay, in a controlled setting, what is the impact? How does food either help or hinder an individual in the early stages of recovery? And right now, like I mentioned, the study just finished the participant part. We are running the sequences on the microbiome data right now, uh, but we have all the other data. We have all the psychological and emotional uh, scales that have been measured, all the numbers there. We have all the biomarker uh, data. And what we know is that the plant-based group has, now this is important. Most people who check in, every single person will for the most part see improvement across the board. Like I, I think it's really important that for individuals who are at the end stage of substance abuse, not only are they checking in with dysregulated brain chemistry, but they're also either overfed and undernourished or underfed and undernourished. So mm -hmm. any time you take someone who prioritizes using over any other self-care uh, routine, and then you put their lives in a system where you base it around healthy eating in some way, shape, or form, you're going to see improvement across the board. However, in every measurable outcome, the plant-based group is doing better. Wow. In every measurable Best outcome. in every single way. <laughs> just in every single way. And we're also, like I mentioned early on, we're capturing qualitative stories of the participants who went through the study. So right. they can tell us how it felt for them, right? Yeah. And what it was like. And we're hearing things from people like, this isn't my first time in recovery. This isn't my third time in recovery. And I was in the plant-based group and this time it just felt different. Oh, wow. And it's oh, unbelievable. Wow. This is such yeah. important work that you're doing, Adam. This is... Uh... Well done you. That's all I can say. Thank you so much. We're really, we're really excited. And I think that, you know, I'm not trying here to say that diet is the solution to addiction recovery. It's not, uh, it's a missing piece of the puzzle that we don't have. And it's, it's an important piece of the puzzle because right now the puzzle looks like something, but if anybody who's done puzzles here, you can, if you don't know what the puzzle looks like and you're trying to put it together and you take one piece and you put it in there, you go, Oh wait, it wasn't a fish. It was a frog, you know? <laughs> The, the entire picture can look completely different just based on one missing piece. Yes. And I think that's really, really, really important. So I suppose another thing must be, like, how many people eat a decent amount of fiber in the world? And if these neurotransmitters, you know, the short-chain fatty acids are made from mm -hmm. the fiber, no wonder it's helping. Well, and the, you know, the thing is, like, I don't know anybody who suffers from one or more chronic disease conditions who also isn't experiencing to some degree, some kind of mental or emotional uh, compromise, right? They're not also, and look, diet doesn't cause anxiety and depression. Okay. These are a reasonable response to life mm -hmm. and more than likely an indication of life not being lived in a way that makes sense to you. However, your diet plays a role in how intense that experience is. Right? And, it, yeah. and in your ability to sit and be present with it. Um, and what we know is there's a lot of data from epidemiology that says that the, the cultures around the world that eat the highest amounts of fruits and vegetables have the lowest incidences of anxiety, stress, and depression. It's correlative data because it's epidemiology, because most of these also have very well meaningfully connected cultures yes. where they have valuable, meaningful relations with people and their work and they move and they live in, the, you know, they, they get a lot of fresh air and sunshine. So there's a lot to it. 
but still it's important. I, I, I think epidemiology does hold weight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, yeah, you're not proving cause and effect, but you know, plant-based doctors already have taken that data, applied this healthy lifestyle to, to people and the nutrition, and they are preventing, treating, and reversing disease with it. So yeah, it works, it's, doesn't it? I mean, my point is this, like even if, even if, and what we are now seeing is that it does, it does have a massive impact on your ability to recover. But even if it didn't, if it's the healthiest diet out there, yeah, it's not going to work. Why is it, why is it not the standard anyway? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. What I really want is, uh, I I wanted to make a shift in how we treat people. I want the, to be a greater representation of that. It's more about how people serve themselves than it is simply the, the the focus of abstinence. I know you're in a rush, Adam. Is there anything you'd like to add before we round up today? One of the things, you know, I, I'm a suicide survivor. Um, I've lost about six friends since getting sober to suicide and overdose um, uh -huh. who were very, very dear friends of mine. And um, I try to say this every, every time um, I have an opportunity to speak with people. Um, if you know somebody who's struggling, if you know somebody, and I think everybody does given what's going on in the world right now, mm -hmm. Um, if you know someone who's struggling, you don't need to have answers. You don't even know, you don't even need to know what to do. You don't even need to know the first step because people who are struggling more than answers to their problems, just want to be reminded that they've not been forgotten by people that matter to them. What you can do and what I would hope for you to do. And I would love it if everyone who's listening is just this week, when you hear this, write down the uh, certain list of people that you know, that you love that matter to you. And I want you to call those people and I want you to say, I love you. I love you, whether you're hurting or you're not, I love you, whatever state you're in. And if you need me, I will be there for you because I don't want you to be alone or feel alone. I if you can that. do that, you're going to remind people that they matter and it has a huge impact. It might be the time that that might be the thing that gets someone to say, I'm really struggling right now and I don't know what to do. And you can say, I don't know either, but we can figure this out together. Nice. I love it. Adam, you're an amazing human being doing so much good in the world. It's been a real honor to connect with you, brother. Oh, thanks. My pleasure, man. My pleasure. Next thing is I, I, I got to work on the, got to work on the guns. We're not, we're not doing like you. a world tour and I'm in America. We'll get down to the gym together and I'll, I'll train you up. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> um, if people want to connect with you online, do you have time to, um, to chat with people? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so you can connect with me on Instagram at Plant Based Addict. Uh, you can uh, my website is my nonprofit website is PlantBasedForPositiveChange.org. You can email me through my website, um, and I'll, I'll respond to you as quickly as possible. I I get a good number of DMs, so just be patient with me. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I do try my hardest to respond to everybody. Adam, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today, and on, on behalf of the people, the planet, and the animals, thank you so much for all the oh, wonderful man. things you're doing, brother. My pleasure. Thank you. 